All right, everybody, welcome back to the Apartment Guys podcast. This is a, another really exciting one for us. Uh, John Prince and I are here and excited to have uh, Mr. Adam A. Adams, AAA himself, in the house talking multifamily with us, and we could not be happier. Uh, John, Mr. Apartment Guy, how are you today? I'm great. Very excited to be here. Very excited to have Adam on with us. And uh, yeah, just weathering the storm in my uh, bunker in Utah. <laughs> yeah, we're all, as you can see, we're all socially distanced <laughs> electronically. Um, so, uh, so Adam, welcome, man. We're, it's this is awesome to have you here, dude. I like that you're in the top, maybe two or three uh, hosts or guests that I wanted. We wanted to have when we started this, so it's really an honor, and we're super happy to have you, dude. Thank you. I'm honored to be here. Um, let me just, let me just yeah. say, oh, sorry, Adam, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, a couple things about Adam real quick. He's like, I, you heard me call him AAA. He is known as uh, Mr. AAA, and uh, he's educated thousands, thousands of investors. Uh, he puts on real estate conferences. He's got a top-rated podcast. He's got a great coaching program, uh, and he, his meetup groups have been in the top 1% of global meetup groups. And he has programs and coaching programs to tell you exactly how he do does that. Um, his, his podcast gets hundreds of thousands of downloads. And uh, he's been, uh, he's earned the title Master Investor by Think Realty Magazine. Uh, and his, like I said, his meetup group is recognized as one of the top six meetup group organizations in the world. Uh, right, uh, right now, Adam is a partner in uh, Blue Spruce Holdings, and they have uh, seven multifamily syndications with approximately 1,400 doors, valued slightly over $100 million. So, Adam, you've had some great success at lots of different levels in this industry, and I uh, really can't wait to talk to you about that. I know your primary role in the company, you attract capital. You, uh, you teach uh, people within your company and outside of your company how to raise capital effectively. And uh, so you've got a lot of superpowers. You're, uh, you know, you're, you're a multi-talented guy, and uh, we're looking forward to, to having a, a really robust conversation here with you. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm excited, and I consider you a good friend, Tate. Uh, we've known each other for a while. I'm from Utah originally, where... I think you both live, uh, yeah. so it's it's kind of kind of cool to be on on the show. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, Adam, let's just kind of dive in. Uh, I know you know I don't know you as well, but it's amazing how uh, I feel like I know you just from your online presence. And you know, Tate kind of talked about superpowers. Uh, it seems something that you're really good at is uh, you know social media, really leveraging podcasting and some of those strengths. Uh, so I wanted to just talk about, you know, how did you even get into syndication? You know, what were you doing before that? And what was the spark that, you know, you know, really brought you into this syndication space? Yeah. Uh, so how I got into syndication, it was 2016 that I really, no, maybe 15, 2015 or 2016, where I learned about syndication, where I learned what it was. And, you know, I was afraid of it. I was, uh, I was scared. I, I had this uneasy feeling about taking money from other people to go into my deals. And I, I thought it, I was actually really, really nervous, but eager. Like if, if there's ever uh, the possibility of, of being uh, completely apprehensive, but eager at the same time, I had that. I, wanted to do it, but I felt like it, I wasn't going to do a good job if I did it. And I, at, in 2015, I had already been in real estate for, for uh, 10 years at the time. And, um, and I had, had only raised about 300 grand, 370,000 um, up until this point. And so, I was looking at other people, syndicators, listening to podcasts, a couple of friends of mine now, Michael Blanc, Rod Cleef, Joe Fairless, all good friends. And But back then, I didn't know who they, I didn't, I didn't think I would ever meet them in person, you know. 
And so I, it seemed like they said it was going to be easy. And so I, I just was trying. I was, I was trying to go forward. I was listening to the podcasts and, and I was trying. But with that fear, I did more fix and flips and tax deed acquisitions and uh, mobile homes and just smaller stuff, even land and, and one scrape uh, because I was trying to feel comfortable doing something like a hundred unit. So that's where I was. And finally I decided to hire a mentor. I was, I, it was already in 2017 and I hadn't done a single thing in syndication yet. Um, my, my meetup was going. I had a ton of people coming to my meetup. I felt like I could probably raise money, but something was holding me back. I was still super scared. So in 2017, I formed a team and we took the education to learn how to syndicate um, commercial real estate investments. And then we just started taking action. We did everything that we were told. Um, and we ended up purchasing a 16 unit was our very first uh, property in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It was an eight unit on the right and an eight unit on the left. It looks like the Twin Towers, tall and skinny. And uh, we ended up closing on that deal. And for the first time in my life, I believed that I could do this business. I didn't believe it the day before I closed that. I was like, something's going to go wrong. But as soon as it was closed, I, I felt almost invincible. I felt like I, I would be able to do this. I proved it to myself. I proved it to my investors. I proved it to future sellers that, that I had what it takes. And, you know, that was really my experience getting into syndication. Adam, would it be fair? So hearing that story, would it be fair to say that getting a mentor was what pushed you over the edge to like, to take the action that you needed to get into syndication? Yep, yep. I tried for two years to do it on my own and just kept running into roadblocks. And having somebody who has been there before was what I needed in order to bounce ideas off of and, and show, show them my underwriting and show them, you know, how I was structuring the deal, show them how much I was raising on in excess of, of what, you needed just for the down payment because all of those unknowns, they say a confused mind says no. When I didn't know some of those things, I just felt so uneasy that I couldn't do anything. But as soon as I had someone in my corner, a coach, you know, in my corner, um, it changed, it changed everything for me for sure. So I know something, you know, a mentor, I've never actually, hired an official mentor. I've been a part of different masterminds, but it can be kind of a crapshoot out there for, you know, there's so much coaching. There's so much, you know, there's so many mastermind groups now. Do you have any advice as far as, you know, how do you filter through all of the, the different coaching, all the different masterminds, all the different mentors out there to really find someone who has the expertise that can really take you to the next level and doesn't just promise that they can. Yeah. Good question. Uh, Good question. Well, I think you guys have a mentor that I know, like, and trust. And so if, um, if you just want to talk about that mentor, I know that people listening will get a lot of value. Um, it's easier to just get a referral than it is to give them all of the data behind how to look for somebody because I think I would be nervous that they would still make a mistake because there's uh, three mentors out there that I hope people don't go with and, um, and your mentor is not one of them. So I would just say, you know, Corey Peterson, uh, Corey, Corey Peterson is a great guy. Yeah. The big um, kahuna. The big kahuna. Yeah, yeah. So, well, but what it takes is <sighs> have they been there before? Are they doing it now? One of the big issues with mentors out there is that they're not doing it now. They found out that it's a multi-million dollar business to become a, a coach or a mentor, to, ho to have an educational company. And what they do, what many 
coaches and mentors do, even the ones that I like, um, often become the CEO and then they hire a lot of coaches for them. And the issue with that to me is that, you know, oftentimes those coaches, they might have done a duplex or a, or a fourplex. Um, it might have been three years ago or 10 years ago. But if they're trying to teach you how to syndicate a multi-million dollar uh, project and they've never bought anything more than a million bucks, never, never even bought a fiveplex or more, which is where you first hit the commercial real estate, it, it makes me sad. It makes me feel really bad. Some of them are my friends who, who have uh, uh, an event or, or a program, a program like this where um, the, the teacher, the real coach for you um, only read the same book that you read. And that makes me really, really sad. It's like you think that you're hiring this person because they're the author or they're the owner or they're the one who owned 10,000 units a long time ago or whatever. Um, so I, I hope people are cautious of if I join this program, am I going to get a manual and my coach is also going to get a manual, but my coach has never done it before? They're just reading from the manual and I'm going to pay 40 or 50 or 60,000 for that. Or do I get to work with the person who is doing the things right now? Not somebody who, who was able to do this business a long time ago and then realized that this is a multi-million dollar business. So they stopped doing the business and start just teaching. Um, really, those are some of the things to look for. But Corey Peterson's a really good friend of mine. So if y'all want to push people toward him, um, great, awesome. I'm, I'm all for that. Well, and just to mention, Adam, because I know you well enough to know that you won't toot your own horn. Uh, you have a wonderful coaching program. You have a great uh, mastermind. I, you call it your boardroom inner circle. Uh, and so you, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll just, I should have said this at the beginning of the show, Adam, you are amongst the one or two reasons I'm in multifamily today and you know showing up at that utah uh, real estate investor associating association meeting where you came in and spoke about uh, i think the five benefits of multifamily and uh i gotta say <laughs> going into it i'm like who's this guy triple a like who calls himself triple a right <laughs> you're not the first one <laughs> he's got this guy's gotta be like uh, whatever and and I got to say, man, you're, you're like one of the most real, authentic, uh, you know, from the heart kind of guys that I've ever met. And you, and you really moved me that night. And uh, so anyway, I, I owe you a personal thanks. And, and we, we've done some coaching with you. Um, I've been to two of your events now. The April event of last year, so almost exactly a year ago, was a life changer for me. And the, the lineup of, of speakers... Uh, the, the, the high level networking was, it just took me in my mindset as far as what's possible to the next level. So, uh, we'll mention the raising money summit right now, since we're, we're talking about it. Uh, that's a, that's coming up in the fall, right, Adam? Yeah. Every first weekend in October. So this one actually be the October 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th. Um, okay. so we'll have all women on the first day, but, um, you know, co-ed the last three days. So it'd be a lot of fun. Wow. Great. You said all women the first three days? Yeah. So oh, cool. yeah, randomly enough, I have this, um, I've got this thing that I feel like isn't happening with other people, like no other um, event out there is doing this. So my main goal is, I don't know if you've noticed this Tate, but on both of the events you attended, I had 50% women. Um, yep. And when I go to other, um, when I go to other conferences, it's like one out of 20 or two out of 20, mm -hmm. two out of 10 max, two out of 10, you know, best case scenario. But, you know, we had, we had 11 out of 20 um, mm -hmm. were female. And that's just kind of the reason I do that is 
on purpose and it's not easy because there's just literally there is more men doing the business right now it's just where it is and also it seems to be um that that men really want to be out there in front and in the limelight and some women are totally fine crushing it in private so for me it's it's almost a struggle to call that many women and say hey i want you on my stage um but the thing the real real issue that i think i see is when when the attendees are 40 percent women but um the speakers are 90 percent men i feel like 40 percent of the audience says i don't know if i could even do this there where's the proof everybody's a man something yeah. like that so I feel like if I can if I can always go 50%, 51% women on my podcast, 50, 51% women on my stages, I feel like that's going to help other women understand I could crush this. I could do just what they did, you know. So I, I guess I'm trying to change the world. Uh, oh, that's awesome. So, yeah. We, in, in spite of being called the apartment guys – uh, you know, and John and I are, are, are manly men, right? But we, uh, we have a, definitely have a, a strong interest and commitment to having as many women as we can on the podcast. And uh, just because, like you, we want to shift the, shift the industry and um, shift the energy a little bit, I guess. And so, um, well, that's great. Um, so... You know, just to kind of address the elephant in the room, we've got uh, we've got a virus right now. We've got a crazy economy and a crazy stock market, and lots of implications on the multifamily world. Um, you know, from you know rate ab rate abatement or, or um, you know freezing rents, freezing evictions. Um, so I guess Adam, what I'm interested in is how this is really affecting you and your company and your properties yeah well uh our properties uh it's a little early to tell still because we're only a few days into the first month where people might not be paying rent so um we'll understand a little bit better as that unfolds um but We've anticipated approximately a 15% delinquency on top of what was normal, um, which is um, $200,000 to our bottom line. Um, so take the 1,400 doors uh, that, we, that I'm a part of um, and then take the about a, it, most of the rents are approximately $1,000 per month. Uh, some are lower and some are higher, but um, and then you multiply the 14 by the thousand and then times it by 15%, we're looking at about $200,000 of potential lost gross revenue this month, but the expenses will probably stay pretty much the same. Um, so, you know, there's that. And so that's scary. Um, looking at our projects right now, we have the capital in there to weather a storm but if the if the storm is two years long um it's going to be really hard it's going to be really really tough and if if other people are right now i suspect that we're we're in 2008 right now 9 10 11 I, i'm seeing two to three years to get out of it um, so, so I'm nervous, but what some economists say and some apartment investors in our industry are saying is this should be over in two to three months, not two to three years. And so if they're right, if, um, if it doesn't have that long lag, because I owned apartments in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, I owned apartments um, and I actually lost an, an apartment because I wanted to do the right thing. And so I kept paying my mortgage when my tenants weren't paying me. And um, it took me till 2011 to end up giving it back to the lender, 2011. So three years was what it looked like for me. And so 
I see this being very similar in nature where where I think other people see that it's going to be done and over in a very short amount of time. Don't worry, we'll be able to get back to work at this time. But the economy already sucked. The economy was already fake. Uh, the um, stocks were already, you know, propped up by nothing. And so I feel like this was the straw that is going to break the camel's back and I don't see it being over anytime soon. But if it did, we have plenty of, re of uh, money in the bank to weather a short storm. Absolutely. But, you know, if I'm right, then it's going to be hard for a lot of people. Um, what are we doing differently right now? We actually just pulled out of a deal. Uh, we, we had a 250 unit uh, apartment community under contract for the last few months. Um, and we had a choice. We had a choice of A, losing $500,000 of, of my money, or B, potentially going into a downturn and risking our passive investors' money. So we had raised, it's about 6 million, so a little 6.2 million was the raise. And we were ready to close. Everything was good to go. And, um, and we thought it best to just lose out on 500 grand. So we lost on a $330,000 acquisition fee, um, which was going straight to our company, which we could have used that money for sure. And we um, got out of the contract after the earnest money was hard. So we've also lost another 180,000. So 510 grand gone. Why? Not because I want to lose 510 grand, but because I'm in this business for 30 years, not two years. I'm not in this business for an acquisition fee. I'm in this business to provide good returns for our past investors for a long period of time. So uh, we're, we're in a bad spot, my company, like we're in a bad spot, just losing 500 grand like that. And with not being able to host events, which is one of our main sources of revenue is when we host our events, we sell into our coaching program. We have uh, the, something called the Blue Spruce Boardroom, and we haven't yet tried to sell that virtually. So we don't know how this is going to affect, but we closed everything down in March, April, May. So everything all together, it's, it's, it's tough times. It's, it's tough times. I won't sugarcoat it, but yeah, you know, we'll see, we'll see what, what happens here with, uh, with the future. You know, are, are you guys underwriting anything right now, Adam? We stopped. We, we stopped underwriting three weeks ago. Uh, if, I was a little ahead of the curve, uh, meaning I, I stopped my um, events before they ever put any bans out. And we stopped our underwriting before anybody else was scared about, um, about closing on deals. And we started figuring out, we were trying to close... We were trying to back out of this deal, um, you know, weeks ago, but the seller didn't understand um, what they didn't think coronavirus was going to be a big deal. And when it finally became a big deal, uh, we were past our time to get our earnest money back. So, yeah, it's I, I felt like I've been, you know, crying wolf and nobody believed in me for for some time. But finally... Uh, the rest of the world's starting to see it, you know, the way that that we were. Uh, we're not underwriting deals. We're not going to underwrite deals. Probably, most likely, for at least 2020. Um, so we'll see what happens in at the end of the year. Um, but we probably won't. We probably won't, aren't going to look for a deal uh, uh, this year, most mm. likely. You know, I, I love what you said, Adam, and that <clears throat> that's definitely. I think a lot of people are feeling that pinch right now, but I do believe in karma in this business. And I think that investors really respect when the person that's running the ship uh, make decisions like that. They know that that person has their money and their best interest at heart and will make the tough decisions to protect that money. And that may not pay off now in 2020, may not pay off in 2021, but that's a decision, like you said, you're in this business for 30 years. And that's the kind of, those are the kind of decisions that, uh, you know, that you'll see come around over a lifetime of investing. 
And, you know, I, I believe in that kind of karma coming back to, to those that are protecting their investors and, uh, and making those, like, you know, like you said, those really tough decisions. Yeah. Yeah. I, ho I hope that's, I hope that's the case. I want to believe in karma too. Um, we just needed to do the right thing. And if it comes back, we'll be thrilled. So, uh, Adam, kind of uh, pivoting a little bit into just deals in general and, you know, in syndication, this business, obviously we're in a very, very unique environment right now, but kind of zooming out and talking about syndication as a whole, you know, what is the number one mistake you see people getting into syndication make? Uh, new, new syndicators, maybe even people that are experienced in, you know, flipping or wholesaling and are starting to make that transition. What do you see them doing a lot that, you know, you wish you could point out and say, hey guys, you know, let's not do this. Well, um, can I give you three? <laughs> three three mistakes? Great. Right. Because uh, I can't decide what one would be like the number one mistake, but um, one big mistake is that there's the blind leading the blind. So that's one of one of the most unfortunate mistakes that I see is a team that nobody's done syndication before, nobody's um, mo nobody's closed on a deal this size before. Um, they've maybe been flipping for 10 years, but they, they don't know this business. Even sometimes, even in my opinion, even if they have a coach, but if nobody on the team has done it before and it's the blind leading the blind, I, I feel that's really scary. That's the first of three huge mistakes I see. The second of three huge mistakes I see is um, the process the direction of when do I find a deal and when do I raise money? People um, automatically say that, okay, I, I, if I don't have a deal yet, then obviously I can't raise money. So I got to hurry and get the deal first, you know, one step at a time, they'll say one step at a time. And I'm going to, I'm going to go and look for a deal uh, and not have the money. There's two big problems with that is when you um, are asking for when you're talking to brokers they're going to ask you where the equity is coming from and if you don't have the money all the way lined up you're probably not going to raise you're probably not going to even get a good deal so the broker isn't going to start feeling confident about you because you've done it backwards you've done it backwards because forward is counterintuitive backwards makes sense but so you think I need to get the deal first, but really you needed to get the money first. It's the biggest, it's, it's a mistake that I see a lot of people making. They get really close to closing, but they can't quite raise all that money. Um, it's difficult because maybe they don't have somebody on the team that's been there before. And so the investors don't want to invest in their very first deal. So, so the three things, here they are. If you can have at least one person on your team that's been through it, that's a big part. Number two, if you raise the money before you even try to find deals, that's going to be a big part. And the third part is what you're, what you're saying on the phone when you're talking to brokers. And some of the mistakes around the what you can say that's wrong is you'll either tell a broker that you'll, you'll try to pretend You'll try to fake it till you make it. You'll be like, oh, my partners and I have this. And they smell that. They smell that so easily. They, and they, they roll their eyes and they don't give you a good deal. They don't trust you because you're not being authentic. You're not being who you are. You're not being your real self. And, um, and so if you don't have somebody on your team, by the way, then they're also not going to know if they could trust you. And if you don't have the money, they don't know if they can trust you. So if, if the listener could do all three of those things, make sure that they got the right person on their team, make sure that they got the money lined up before they ever called a broker. And then when they call the broker, if they could be truly authentic about everything, that would be huge. And if I could give you a bonus, fly to the broker instead of call the brokers. So be there, go take them to lunch, take them to dinner, take them to coffee. Um, fly to the area 
and get um, intimate with the broker in a way. Get close with the broker. Uh, talk about football. Talk about what they're going through. Get to know them as a person. Understand how to BRT. A lot of the other people that who are from your state of Utah, uh, they know what BRT means already. Outside of that, you don't. It means build a relationship of, of trust. And I think when you do those things, you, they, they, you pretty much can't lose. But if you only do a couple of those, you probably still will. Can I um, highlight one takeaway? Yeah, jump in, take. uh, if I could. Flying to your market is, uh, you know, if you, if you want to take this real seriously and take it to the next level, going to meet the brokers, meet the property managers, walk the properties, tour the neighborhoods, get to know the amenities of the city, uh, that is absolutely crucial work in this business. In in our opinion, over here at, in our team, we've done a lot of um, market visits this year, and and we've had a couple properties under contract in uh, Albuquerque, Oklahoma City. We've been working on, and uh, we've spent a lot of time in both those markets. So uh, also San Antonio, I've spent some time there. So uh, yeah, I can't emphasize that enough, Adam. That's a gem right there. Is Spend spend the, whatever money it takes to, if you're serious about buying in wherever Tulsa, you know, or or Dallas, uh, go go there, go there for sure. And you you brought up uh you brought up another big one, you know, with the within the process. So people seem think that they need to find a deal, and then they need to find a property manager, and then they need to find the money. Property managers in the beginning. Uh, mm -hmm. You want to have your property manager picked out before you talk to the broker. You want to be able to tell the broker, this is who's on my team. This is the management company that we've selected. Um, the broker will feel a lot more, a lot better about you as a buyer if you have a solid uh, property management company already ready to go. Yeah. And it, sh it shows them that you know what you're doing. If you know, if you know that you actually need that, that's that makes you st stand out amongst other buyers that are just kicking the tires, you know. Mm -hmm. Adam, I heard on uh, I believe it was one of your podcasts that I was listening to another guest, and I can't remember his name right now, but he seemed to be emphasizing when it came to raising money, patience. He said he's very patient with his investors. You know, he's he he tries to be their source of information. You know, he lets them know what deals he's doing. He creates that excitement. But he seems to let you know them come to him, and it seems like really good advice on their own, you know, on their own time frame. And so, you know, can you speak to that a little bit? Because what are those conversations like when you're talking to investors and trying to raise money, but you don't have a deal? You know, how are you? Are you just building excitement? And what are some of the things you're saying to them so that when you do have a deal, you know that you can call on that person to to be someone that you can have a part of the raise? Yeah. Good question. Well, um, this takes me back to um, poker and the thing called a slow play. Uh, you're, you're playing poker. You've got a good hand. You, you lay it all out on the table. Everybody's going to fold, right? So what you want to do is you want to string it along. You want to, you want to always leave some breadcrumbs there so that, so that, you can, they can take the bait and they can start going toward you. And so I, the next analogy that I have to kind of explain this is, is magnets. And typically most human beings, most of us, not every single one, most humans are um, naturally, uh, what's the word for it? When they, they don't want to trust you right away, they're naturally kind of standoffish. Let me have you prove yourself before I open up. Um, skeptical. Humans are naturally pretty skeptical. So um, if you're, if what I'm saying is with these magnets is they're already pushing against you and everybody else. Everybody does that. Um, you know, you talk to people in elevators these days and they're like, what does he want? What does he want? Like, don't talk to me. It's because we're naturally, naturally skeptical. And you want to notice Sandler is, uh, Sandler's a sales training guy. 
um, Sandler talks about pulling people to you rather than pushing them. Back in the past, um, the sales tactics that worked best was when we, when we were really dominating and we were like, you have to invest in this deal. There's no other way. That worked well back then. But right now, we have everybody on, on a magnetism showing their north. And if you come and show your north, they're going to be repelled. They're going to go farther from you. What you got to do is you got to just turn around, show your south, and they, they come against you really, really, really fast. So if you study Sandler, he talks about, he talks about having, trying, to, trying to be a slow play. When we're dating, when we're going on dates and stuff, we don't ask the other person to marry us the, the day we meet them, usually. Um, we would get slapped. And so the, the, the whole thought process around this is how do you find a way to um, play that dating game with your future spouse slow enough so that they stay with you? How do you play that poker game slow enough so that other people will bet and not fold? So that's what I'm talking about within, within the process of raising money. We need to be thinking about let's just add Let's just add value, add value, add value, and literally just wait until somebody says, can I please invest with you? That seems to be a way that works really well for me. I put out content, I, I host events, and, people, and I just be me, my real true authentic self, and then I get people calling me and saying, Adam, I've got $1.8 million dollars. I want to invest it with you. I've been watching you for two years. So around the question of, of why should we just let them come to us is because they're too sensitive. Human beings are too sensitive to us going and telling them that, that apartments are better than the stock market or apartments are better than fix and flips. We just need to be a lighthouse we need to stand our ground. We need to be somewhere where they can see us, like a thought leadership platform. And we need to keep rotating that light, but we're not trying to chase the boats around. We just, we just be who we are. And what ends up happening is people get so attracted to you, to, to want to invest with you, because they're looking at this as, this is a reasonable person. This, they've never pushed anything on me, um, which is almost if we can illustrate something that happened on this call, which I didn't do as a Sandler sales training tactic, but I was pushing people to, um, to Corey Peterson as a coach, as a mentor. And without me doing anything or thinking anything or trying anything, Tate, wanted to mention that I do that too. It's, I just feel so strongly that we need to think about the magnets, how everybody's naturally pointing north, and we just, we just need to flip around and start pointing south, and we'll pull people toward us rather than repelling them. Hmm. Yeah. I think that's, uh, yeah, I mean, that's excellent advice. Uh, you seem... Something that I've noticed that you do really well, Adam, is you seem to be a master of this on social media and podcast. I mean, those seem like great ways to create that FOMO, uh, you know, the fear of yeah. missing out. Yeah. So people are constantly seeing, you know, and this is a reason why it's important to be active on social media, why you might think about doing something like a podcast is that if you're consistent with it, you're allowing people to passively see what you're doing passively kind of be a little bit jealous almost of, mm -hmm. Oh man, you know, I wish I could be a part of one of these deals that Adam's doing and Oh, he just closed a 250 unit. You know, how can I be a part of that? And as that relationship builds, you know, maybe they reach out to you on Facebook messenger, or, you know, and you start to build that relationship of trust. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I just think that that's something that you do really well and, you know, quick plug for Adam. I mean, we had mentioned before the call, you, you do help people out with podcasts as well, correct? Yeah. People are yeah. thinking about starting a podcast. Uh, he had mentioned that, you know, for a fee, they'll, 
they'll guarantee to get you a, a top 1% podcast or your money back and uh, not trying to be too pluggy here, but I mean, that is a really valuable service. I mean, it's uh, invaluable. To, it's, it's priceless to, to have that kind of listenership and that sort of attention and a thought leadership platform is, is just so, so uh, beneficial in so many ways in your wheelhouse. What, what are, share with us a little bit about what it is that keeps you lit up. Yeah. Good question. Honestly, um, something that I found when I was on um, the the Mindset podcast, um, I learned about myself deeper than normal just because of Stephen's questions. Um, so he's got the investor mindset thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, he was in one of my masterminds. So we um, supported him a lot in his podcast. And he's got one of those top 1% podcasts. But when I was on there and learning about my own self, I feel like a lot of my mindset set stems from when I was in kindergarten. So I'm just going to be completely honestly uh, honest with you. Um, when I was in kindergarten, I was smaller than all the other kids. Um, when I was in, so I have ADD, I'm dyslexic, and I felt very self-conscious about, um, I felt like I was dumber than the other kids. And I got in some fights and I didn't know how to eloquently use words to get out of fights. I had to beat up the kindergartners uh, to feel like I won that fight. It was, it, it was something interesting. So I think it really stems in the very beginning of me uh, feeling like I need to prove something to somebody. There's the beginning of it. And the second part of it is, comes with um, when people tell me that I can't or I, I won't be able to, I tend to prove it anyway. I tend to prove it. So in seventh grade, I was I learned how to first start writing music. I was in I was very young and I started playing an instrument and then I started writing an instrument just within a couple of weeks and started writing like pieces with multiple instruments. Mm. And so I remember this is a turning point in my whole life that I'm about to share that, that really helps you understand my mindset around all of this. I went to my junior high band director and I said, hey, I'm going to write a symphony and we're going to play it at the end of the year. Uh, so we were already in the second, um, second quarter. And um, so I, I had a very short amount of time, but he laughed. He laughed at me. My junior high band director laughed at me. And that made me feel like I, it took me back to kindergarten. It took me back to proving myself to, to, to people. And I ended up writing a symphony, an entire symphony, multi, like every instrument. I, and I had, to, I had to play every instrument. I had to learn how to play them. And then I had to learn how to play them well. And then I started being able to write an entire score for the whole symphony to play. And um, when I finished it, we ended up playing it that year. At the end of the year, we, we did it, right? And so a lot, of, a lot of the things that I do stem from that, that experience. And this quote by Calvin Coolidge, that my junior high band director made me learn uh, talking about persistence and determination are omnipotent. Um, if you keep pushing forward, if you keep trying, you will succeed. And so ever since I, I proved that to myself, that I wrote a symphony in that short of time, that my persistence mattered, you know, it helped me get a gold medal in a triathlon. It helped me, you know, go to the junior Olympics. It helped me do a lot of really cool things. And it's all around me being able to prove to myself that I can accomplish a thing. Um, I do weird diets like raw vegan diets for a little while. Uh, it's hard to be raw vegan at the same time. I, I fast shout sometimes. Out, shout out to water fasting. I just saw that you and, did a yeah. water fast. And I do things like CrossFit because I just, I love pushing myself. I think that that's a big part of my main mindset is, is I want to do something that not everybody thinks that they can do either to prove it to me or to, or to inspire other people. So that's a big underlying part of, of, you know, 
why I do a lot of the things that I do. You're such a powerful thought leader in, uh, in the multiple spaces we've talked about. I'm curious what thought leaders are important to you that inform you, the podcasts you listen to. Uh, yeah. You dropped some pretty big names there towards the beginning of the podcast with Joe Fairless, Michael Blanc, Rod Cleef. Uh, I'm sure those guys are friends, but you probably learn a ton from them too, huh? Yeah, so I've been a member of Rod's Mastermind, um, and I haven't been a, a paying member, but I've been invited to a lot of Michael Blanc's masterminds. Um, and, you know, Joe Fairless and I, what, like, we don't talk a lot, but I, I helped him a little bit with his meetup a long time, like three, two, two years ago. Um, but, uh, but all three of them uh, have so many amazing things about them, you know, who else do I learn from? I learn from, I, I actually study from Pat Flynn. Um, I study by, um, by listening to all of his episodes, listening carefully to the personality that he uses uh, in his episodes, listening carefully to how much banter he uses versus how much content um, to the types of advertisements that he has. Uh, Pat Flynn um, is, he teaches a lot of people how to um, launch podcasts. The difference, the difference is I guarantee, I give a full money back guarantee if it's not a top 1%. So I want to help you launch a podcast. But if within a few weeks, if it's not uh, in the top 1%, if you don't have at least 100 ratings and reviews on your podcast within a few weeks, then I give you all of your money back, right? So I, but as far as the content, I study all the influencers. I don't listen to Rod Cleef and Michael Blanc's podcast and, and, and uh, Joe Fairless's podcast because I need to know how to syndicate a deal or something like that. I've been syndicating deals. I've been in real estate for 15 years, but I listen very carefully because they're three of, of the top influencers, including Jake and Gino. Um, they're, those are the four top influencers in the multifamily space based on downloads per episode. They all have more than me. And um, until, until, I'm, until I'm surpassing them, I'm always going to study every move that they make. So a lot of my time, a lot of my effort goes toward watching their content, listening to their content all day. Um, when it comes to Facebook stuff, like I crush it at that. I don't need to learn from anybody. I teach other people that, but when it comes to podcasting, I've got some cool stuff to do, but to really gain, these guys are in the top 1% of 1%. They're, they're, these guys have thousands of, 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 uh, of ratings and reviews on their podcast. That's huge compared to the average. Uh, the average podcast has uh, less than 20 reviews. The average one. So once you once you get past 20, you're in now in the top 90 percent. And once you get past 100 reviews, you've become in the top one percent. And then once you get to a thousand, you're in the top one percent of one percent. So I strive to learn everything I can to to incorporate the personalities that they use, um, at least as long as it's authentic to me. But um, I'm, I'm, I, I watch them. A lot, a lot more than you would expect. So, mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. So, uh, along those lines, any books that have been uh, influential in your growth pattern along the way? Any favorites that stick out? Yeah. Joe, honestly, um, I've read one. I told you earlier I was, I'm dyslexic. So, I've read uh, one book besides religious books when I was younger. Um, I've only finished. Um, Rich Dad Poor Dad by actually reading it. Um, and so that was the most influential by far. I've listened to so far this year, 27 books um, and we're only a few months into it. So, nice. but I, I, I listened to a lot of books. They're all influential. Um, 
Traction is a big one. Traction is a huge one that my company is trying to work on. Yeah, that's good stuff for a small company. So, um, Adam, I'm, you again, you're just such a, a nice guy, like an authentically nice guy. I know everybody says that about you because it's true. Um, what impact are you committed to making in this in this space and in, in the multifamily space and just in the world in general? Yeah. Uh, biggest thing is just to inspire, inspire other people to do something that they didn't think that they could do. Um, so I, I do that by, you know, being who I am and just showing that you can do it. And um, I have been taking uh, eight calls, eight 10 minute calls every single day for the last two plus years. Uh, maybe it's not always eight, but I always have eight openings. But um, yeah, for the most part, at least lately, I've got those calls. And so that's a big part of what I'm committed to do. And outside of that, there's a couple of causes that like matter to me that I, I support financially uh, with my money and also f with my uh, thought leadership platform. So I I bring people in and I give them a few thousand dollars of, of sponsorship. And the last time that that happened, um, they, they, I think they made over 10 grand and it was just a quick mention. And, um, and, and so yeah, one of them's autism and the other one's human trafficking. But nice. the, um, those are kind of the things that I, that I really care about. Where could people reach you, Adam? Yeah, so realbluespruce.com is an easy way to find the podcast and um, realbluespruce.com is how they can find my email or learn about my company or learn about coaching programs. Everything's kind of under that hub. Awesome. Well, Adam, I know personally I am super grateful that you took the time today. You've been very generous with your time to talk with us. I know I learned a lot. I, I mean, truly picked up a lot of things and just thoughts that I want to incorporate and I know our listeners have too. Um, so we just thank you, you know, on behalf of the apartment guys, really glad that we were able to have you on. Um, hopefully we can have you on in the future and uh, you know, good luck uh, weathering the storm here over the next few months. And let's all just hope that it's a, a sharp recovery. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks Adam. Stay healthy. You too. <laughs> all right, bro.